one bird. What are the other firms doing? Why other firms are not coming in to this industry or join this market? So, reasons. Why? Only one cell. One explanation is that that firm controls FICO inputs. So in other words, if you want to produce a final product, you need to use inputs. But if that firm in the industry is controlling the inputs that you must get to produce the product, and if that firm is not sharing the inputs, then you cannot produce this product. For example, diamond. So, if you want to produce diamond ring, diamond ear ring, diamond necklaces, you need to have diamond. But if all the diamond mines, pretty much controlled by one group, then you will have no access to the raw diamond that you won't be able to sell diamonds. And that's what happened with the DPS group. So, at the peak, this group controls 70% of all the diamond mines in South Africa, the largest diamond producer in the world. And therefore, it pretty much has the monopoly power that is controlling the diamond markets. The other example, Hydro. So, in order to use water energy to generate electricity, you need to have water flowing at a very high speed. And that only happens in Niagara Falls. So, when Hydro put a power generator under Niagara Falls, then other firms cannot use it. So, Hydro becomes the monopoly to use water to generate electricity. Another reason why no firms can enter is because of government license, patents, copyright, that prevent people from producing product or even similar product. Well, the famous example of government license is the LCBO. It's a monopoly. In Ontario, if you need to get alcoholic beverages, anything with alcohol content, you have to go through the liquid control for the Ontario LCBO. So that becomes a monopoly. Government creates this monopoly. Next, it is because of credible threat. That is, the firm in the industry, the firm in the market, threatens all the other potential firms. Don't even think about coming into this market, because if you do, I will start a price war, and I will make you lose money. So if other firms believe this firm has a capacity, has a capability of starting a price war and make you lose money, you wouldn't want to challenge that threat because you don't want to lose money. Example for that would be, imagine, this is a small town and Walmart comes into this small town and has a supermarket selling grocery items and household items. And then Walmart, tells everyone in this town, if you put up another store, Walmart will start a price war, will start cutthroat pricing, make sure you lose money. <clears throat> now, in the world, you don't have that many firms in the world that can actually challenge Walmart. Why? Walmart operates thousands and thousands of stores. It buys in bulk. So it has a lot of good suppliers and good discount. In terms of cost, you cannot beat Walmart. So if people believe Walmart will start a price war in this town, 
and they would stay away from this chant because no one wants to lose money. Another reason that would be what we call the switching cost. So people have been using this product, but it is too costly to switch. For example, iPhone. If you have been using iPhone all along, and all your friends are using iPhones, you wouldn't want to switch to Samsung. Because if you use Samsung while all your friends are using iPhone, then you cannot do FaceTime with them. You cannot do iMessage with them. So pretty much you are putting yourself out of the social circle. Another one is product differentiation. In other words, uniqueness of the product. It could be technology. So this product is unique in a sense to some customers. So some, some customers, they only want to buy this product, not the other product. So because this product fits the taste, fits the requirement, the best in the market. Therefore, in this market, no one can challenge this firm's position. And last, cost advantage. This firm has a cost advantage over all other firms. It may have a special production technique or it may have better management. So if this firm has a lower cost than other firms, other firms will be pushed out of business if they enter this industry. Because this firm at the lower cost can afford to charge a lower price. Meanwhile, not losing money. But you have a higher cost, you enter, you will lose money. You cannot compete with this firm for with price. And therefore, you wouldn't want to challenge this firm. We will come back to the cost of bad paper later on today. So now we understand the six most common factors or causes why there is only one firm in the industry. Next, the difference between perfect competition and the law. Under perfect competition, supply equals demand. The market determines the competitive equilibrium price and the competitive equilibrium quantity. And then, each firm will take this competitive equilibrium price as given and this will be their individual firm, demand firm, compared to the market. So this is what we learned last week. The market demand is different from the competitive firm demand. And now, if we have monopoly, only one firm, and this firm serves the entire market. So the monopoly is facing the market demand curve. So if the monopoly is facing the market demand curve, then things would not be as straightforward as perfect competition. Because under perfect competition, last week we showed that the price equals to marginal revenue equals to average revenue. And when we set the price, which is marginal revenue, equal to marginal cost, we can figure out the maximum profit output for the firm. But now, the monopoly does not have a horizontal demand curve, and therefore, price is not equal to marginal cost. And we need to figure out a way to find the marginal revenue for the monopoly. 
so that we can find the profit maximizing outcomes. So, marginal revenue, something we came across when we talk about electricity. So, imagine if this is the market demand, the monopoly basis in the market. So, at this price, the people will be buying this quantity. And at a lower price, people will want to buy a larger quantity. The typical downward sloping market demand. So, total revenue equals to price times quantity. And when you change the price, you change the quantity. And when you change the price and quantity, you change the total revenue. Because total revenue equals to price times quantity. You change the price, quantity will change. When the price and quantity change, total revenue will also change. So the change in total revenue comes from two effects. One is the quantity effect. Talking about changing quantity. The other one comes from the price effect. Talking about the change in price. So, The price times the change in quantity, which is this area. So this is the price, this is the change in quantity. The price effect is here. This is the quantity, and this is the change in price. It is similar to what we did in the chapter for electricity. So the change in total value comes from two sides or two sources, price effect and quality effect. <coughs> now, if the change in total value comes from the quantity effect and the price effect. Then, if we divide both sides by the change in quantity, this is what we call marginal revenue. The change in total revenue when there's a change in quantity. That's how we define marginal revenue last week. So marginal revenue equals to price plus the change in P over change in Q times Q. So that is the marginal revenue. Now, how useful is this equation? Well, at first look, it is not that clear. But if we use a very, very simple form of the demand equation. For example, if we have the demand equation P equals to A minus B times Q. In other words, the demand curve has the intercept A and the slope minus B. All right, simple high school geometry. The line, the equation for the straight line. And now, with this in mind, the change in P, when there's a change in Q, goes like this. A is a parameter, doesn't change. So 
when v change in v, q will change. But minus p is in front of q, so we have to consider that as well. Therefore, the change in p over change in q is negative p, which is the slope of the demand curve. Because in the graph, this is the rise. Change in Q is the run. Rise of the run tells us the slope. And now, it becomes a little bit clear what that marginal gradient equation would mean. Because if this is the marginal gradient equation, then marginal gradient is equal to P a minus b times q, the demand equation, plus change in p over change in q is negative b. And therefore, marginal value equals to a minus 2bq. Compared to the demand, p equals to a minus bq. What do we see in similarity and difference between these two equations? First, they have the same intercepts, A. And the marginal value is twice as steep as the demand curve. Because the slope is minus 2B, the demand curve of the slope is minus B. And now, with this, we can come to this graph. The marginal residue curve starts with the same vertical intercept, A, and it is twice as B. So the slope is negative 2B. So in other words, when we have the demand curve equation, or when we have the demand curve, we can easily derive the marginal revenue curve from the demand curve equation. So let's work on a numerical example. So in the demand equation, P equals to 100 minus Q, then the marginal revenue equation 100 minus 2Q. Right away, we can write down the marginal gravity equation. The demand curve equation, vertical intercept is 100. Down here, also 100. Because when Q equal to 0, P equal to 100, according to the demand curve equation. Same in here. When P equal to 0, Q equal to 100. So we can easily figure out the location of the demand with the demand equation. And now, for the marginal revenue, same vertical intercept, but it is twice as deep. That means it is falling twice as fast. So down here, it is 50, because up here, when Q equals to 0, marginal revenue equals to 100. Down here, when P equals to 0, Q equals to 50, according to the marginal revenue equation. In other words, when this quantity is 40, then this value is 60 in price. And when this is 60 in marginal value, the quantity will be 20. So now with these two values, what we can say is that 
the marginal revenue is always the halfway mark. Horizontal between the demand curve and the vertical axis. Because when the demand curve is 100 in quantity, horizontal, marginal revenue is 50. When demand is 40, marginal revenue in quantity is 20. So these are very useful insights that can help us easily plot the marginal revenue curve for the monopoly. And now we get the marginal revenue. So we can easily figure out the profit maximizing up. Step number one, as what we just did, use the demand curve to figure out the marginal revenue. So when we have the demand curve, we can easily figure out the marginal revenue curve. Step number one. Figuring out the marginal revenue curve. Step number two. The golden rule for profit maximization. That is marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. If we have the marginal cost like this, marginal revenue equal to marginal cost, that will help us figure out the profit maximizing output, QM, for the monopoly. So this is Step number two, figuring out the profit maximizing outputs for the monopoly. Step number three, to capture the maximum profit, the firm must sell all these QM units. So this is the profit maximizing quantity. But if you want to really maximize your profit, you have to find a way to sell all these units. How? Check the demand curve. When output is here, what is the price to sell all these units? That is, when we have this quality of output, look at the demand. What price you should set to sell your output so that you can get all the output sold? And this is the monopoly price. Step number three. So these are the three steps to maximize profit for the monopoly. Figure out the marginal revenue curve first, and then with the marginal cost equal to marginal revenue, you figure out the profit maximizing out. Then, figure out the price that you can charge to sell all these units so that you can get the maximum profit. And now, we have figured out the profit maximizing outputs and price for the monopoly. Next, two misperceptions about monopoly. Number one, only one firm profit is guaranteed. So, for example, if we have only one firm 
offering this product or this service in the GTA area, does it mean this firm is guaranteed with profit? Of course not. Can you find me an example? We have a monopoly providing us with one service that it is not making a profit. It is losing money year after year in the last 40, 50 years. In GTA, it's a monopoly. Everyone drives? Anyone taking the chances? TDC. TDC is the only firm or institution offers subway service to us, and it is losing money. So a monopoly does not guarantee profit. This is why. So this is the demand curve and the marginal revenue. So, marginal cost, this would be the monopoly output, and this would be the monopoly price. Step one, step two, step three, all in this graph. So, charging a monopoly price, being a monopoly, does not guarantee profit if your cost is high. Your cost is up here, and therefore, you are losing this money. The average cost per unit is about the price you get. So this is the TTC scenario. So why is it losing money? Well, the cost is high. Why the cost is high? Because one reason, unions. If you look at the TDC employees, how much money they make compared to the market salary, they are making more than the private market employees are making. So if they are taking more pay, the cost must be high, and that's why they are losing money. This is one explanation. So this indicates if the firm cannot control its cost, being a monopoly would not help or guarantee a profit. Number two misperception is that monopoly produces smaller output Jack up the price. And therefore, it gets more revenue. As a result, more likely to make profits. So, let's look at this statement and figure out what is wrong with this statement. Looks like it makes sense. If the revenue goes up, more likely that you will make a profit. So first, monopoly produces smaller output and higher price. So if we have a competitive market, demand equals supply. So this would be the competitive output and this would be the competitive equilibrium price. So how can we compare the competitive market outcomes to monopolies? Well, one minor twist. We can bring the two into one graph. That is, assume all competitive firms merge into a giant corporation. which can block new firms from entering. 
In other words, only one firm in the industry. So if all these competitive firms merge into one giant corporation, and this giant corporation can block any new firms from entering, so this giant corporation will become the only firm in the industry, i.e. a monopoly. So in the process of merging into one giant corporation, remember the supply curve in the competitive industry is actually coming from the marginal cost of all the competitive firms. So when this firm merges into one giant corporation, this becomes the marginal cost for the giant corporation. The monopoly. And now, when this becomes a monopoly mark, the three steps we talk about use the demand curve to figure out the marginal revenue. Use the marginal revenue combined with the marginal cost to figure out the profit maximizing output and then use that output and check with the demand to figure out how much you charge to sell all these units to get the maximum profit. Now we can compare competitive output, price with the monopoly <coughs> output and price. So what do we see? When this market changes from competitive to monopoly, output drops the price goes up. And therefore, remember the statement about the second misperception. Monopoly produces smaller output. Yeah, that's right. Check up the price. That is right. And now, this is question. Why? Check up the price. Selling a smaller quantity and resulting in higher total revenue. What does it imply about elasticity? Check up the price. You sell smaller quantity, but the total revenue will rise. It is inelastic. So, all this implies the demand elasticity is inelastic. And this is where the statement is wrong. How do we know? Lower the output, sell it at a higher price. 
total revenue would rise, that means we must be in this region. Demand is elastic. Marginal cost is positive. If you need to produce more outputs, it must cost you money. Nothing is free. You cannot produce one more unit of output without raising the total cost. So marginal cost is positive. And marginal cost equals to marginal revenue, which must be positive for us to find the maximum profit output QM. So in other words, if marginal cost is slightly above zero, like this, This will be the profit maximizing output. And it must be to the left of the unit elastic form. That is, demand is always elastic for the monopoly. So that's why that statement is wrong, because this statement implies the monopoly always operating in the elastic region. In fact, it is not. With positive marginal cost, the monopoly always operates in the elastic section of the demand curve. So now, we clarify two misperceptions. Next, efficiency. Remember, we have this graph. Supply, which is marginal cost, demand. And this will be the competitive equilibrium quantity, competitive equilibrium price. Demand represents marginal benefit. And therefore, at the equilibrium, the competitive equilibrium outcome. Marginal benefit equals the marginal cost, that is demand equals supply. We have the maximum total surplus, zero debt and loss. And if it becomes a monopoly, like what we did earlier, figure out the marginal revenue, figure out the monopoly output, figure out the monopoly price. Now we have a problem. At this monopoly profit maximizing output, the marginal benefit and the marginal cost are not equal. As we know from the consumer service chapter, when marginal benefit not equal to marginal cost, that we loss exists, which is this area. And therefore, given this firm monopoly power, it will turn the efficient outcome of a competitive market into a monopoly market that is causing the debt rate loss in the society, which is not efficient. So now, in other words, if we leave this to the market, this firm has monopoly power, will not give us efficient outcome. This is typical market failure. The market failure to allocate resources efficiently because now we have debt rate loss. And from chapter one, we learned that when market fails, government can make correction. How? Well, Something that we learn 
in the Christ on Trump's chapel. That is, use the Christ seal. Where the marginal cost cuts the demand, which is marginal bank. Set the price ceiling where the marginal cost cuts the demand curve, which is the marginal value. So in the graph, this is where the marginal cost cuts the demand for the monopoly. And we set that to be the legal maximum. In other words, the demand curve will become something like this. For this unit, from zero to here, for this unit, no one is allowed to pay more than this, the price ceiling, which is the competitive equilibrium price, which is also what we call marginal cost price. So this price ceiling is what we call the marginal cost price. Because this is where the marginal cost equals to demand. We set that level of the price ceiling. So for all these units, from zero to here, all these units, Everyone must pay this price as the maximum, which effectively, bending this portion of the demand curve to make it horizontal. Because no one can pay this price anymore. It is illegal. It's about the price ceiling. So the price ceiling effectively, bending the demand curve, making it horizontal up to here. And now, we learned something about horizontal demand last week. When demand curve is horizontal, price equals to marginal revenue equal to average revenue. In other words, at this point, now we have the marginal cost pricing, which is the marginal revenue under marginal cost pricing, equals to marginal cost. And that gives the firm incentive to pick this quantity because it is where marginal revenue equals to marginal cost. So now, by using the marginal cost pricing, we can effectively push the firm to produce competitive output to eliminate the debt rate loss. So, let's explore marginal cost pricing a little bit in more detail. So, what we learned is that Perfect competition. Charging this price, producing this output, we get the maximum total surplus. The debt rate loss doesn't exist under perfect competition. But for the monopoly, the monopoly output is less than competitive output. And therefore, the debt rate loss for the monopoly exists. The solution to restore allocative efficiency, that is, zero debt rate loss, 
where marginal benefit equals to marginal cost at the competitive output. The solution to that is the marginal cost price. Always works because we are setting the price equals to the marginal cost. The price on the demand curve is marginal benefit. Because marginal cost pricing is where the demand equals to marginal cost. In other words, we are forcing marginal benefit equals to marginal cost under the marginal cost pricing. And that's why we can always eliminate the debt rate loss. But can it solve all the problems? Or it will fix some problem and create some other problem? So let's look at three scenarios. <coughs> Scenario number one. We have a monopoly. The demand curve, the marginal revenue curve. And here is the long run marginal cost. And here we have the long run average cost. So this is the monopoly output charging this monopoly price. And this area represents the debt weight loss of the monopoly. Hopefully in this area. So this is the debt weight loss for the monopoly. This area. So in this case, what do we see? Initially, this output is less than the competitive output, which is here. And therefore, that rate loss exists. And the output is not at the minimum long run average cost. The output is here, which is not the minimum long run average cost that we produce as a monopoly output. In other words, initially, it is not allocative efficient because we have that rate loss. And we are not productive efficient because we are not producing at the minimum long run average cost. So if we have this scenario, number one, the monopoly starts with not being allocated efficient, not being productive efficient. And now the government steps in and imposing the marginal cost price with the marginal cost price, marginal cost equals demand at this point. So it becomes the price ceiling under the marginal cost price. And this will become the effective demand curve. And the firm will produce the competitive output. Like what we explained earlier. And therefore, with government intervention, that way loss eliminated. 
So now it is allocated efficient, zero debt rate loss. At the same time, at this output, we also get the minimum cost per unit. We are also productive efficient. This scenario one is the lucky case. By luck, using the marginal cost pricing, the government fixes two problems, allocated inefficiency and productive inefficiency. What about another scenario? We can wait 10 minutes. So let's take a 10 minutes break first.